because of time. I want to do kind of a high altitude uh, flyover here uh, on some things uh, just to make sure we're covering uh, some of the basics. So one of the key things um, I often see is um, mismanagement of livestock to the farm. Um, I think this is critical for success. Um, the, the type of terrain, the type of land, the type of soil you have on your farm, I think is absolutely critical to success. And I'm gonna cover uh, all of them here, but with, and, and I'm putting cattle in here just for comparison's sake. But cattle tend to work best with gentle, uh, level to gently rolling um, terrain, predominantly grasses, forbs, and legumes. Some woodies are fine. Uh, we can get cattle into wet sites during a drought when it's dry enough to support them, but compare that to sheep. Sheep, we can go from level to much more rolling uh, terrain out there. Again, predominantly grasses, forbs, and legumes, and some woodies are fine. Um, sending them off in the deep, dark woods is probably not a good idea, and swamps can definitely be a problem. Goats, level to steep uh, ground, can also handle rocky ground. So for those of you way out in western Minnesota dealing with rock outcrops, there may be some opportunity here. Um, we're using sheep or excuse me goats throughout a lot of areas in Minnesota um, that are super steep, even too steep for mechanical um, management or treatment. And so that cre creates a huge opportunity. Um, predominantly brushy if we're concerned about the health of the animals. Also mixed with some forbs like ewes and grasses. So Again, it's, it's not an all or nothing thing, but uh, these are kind of the ways we want to lean. And with goat swamp, I've seen some people buy cheap land that was predominantly swamp, threw some goats out there, and it was a complete train wreck. So we've got to watch that. Key management challenges with small ruminants. I typically say if you can figure out the predator and the parasite disease thing, you're probably got a fighting chance of making it work. Um, we can deal with predators with fencing, livestock guard animals, um, moving to a flirt type thing, particularly that includes cattle. As long as the sheep and the cattle bond well together, the cattle can be uh, a, a, a deterrent for a lot of predators. And then just management uh, that can keep things, uh, uh, keep the animals moving, throw those predators off, off guard uh, and keep them guessing all the time. Parasites and disease, um, looking at alternate species as we graze through sheep and cattle. Cattle can be a dead end host for a lot of sheep parasites. So uh, we, can, we can use that forage uh, that's coming up fast with a different species and minimize some parasite problems. Leaving adequate residue height, this is huge. Uh, a lot of these parasitic problems are at or near the soil surface and so grazing taller makes a big difference. Long enough recovery periods to break those pest cycles. Bare, bare, bare minimum. Probably 30 days for a lot of these pest problems. And then selecting for parasite resistance in your genetics. And that's a hard one to do because we've been propping up some of these breeds for so many years because we've had the tools, but now a lot of those tools aren't working so great anymore. Uh, in, uh, as, as far as pharmaceuticals, um, we're gonna, I think we're going to have to start looking pretty hard at parasite resistance uh, in, our, in our genetic selection. So it's, it's probably worth the money, worth the effort, even though when you're trying to get going and building a herd, culling is something hard, um, but it's something I think for the long haul it's worthwhile. So let's switch to the grazing piece. Um, grassland health is maintained by occasional short-term disturbance, but it has to be followed with adequate rest. Grazing is a trauma to the plant. But these biological systems can handle minor injury, if you will, if they're given an opportunity to recover. Think about us. We get a cold. We get a scratch on our hand. There needs to be an opportunity to recover. Biological systems, if given an opportunity and are generally overall healthy, can recover. And adequate rest really is the key to pasture productivity. We're trying to pr protect both the roots and the crowns. When we have 50% or less use uh, of the plant, of the above ground biomass of the plant, we really have negligible impact on the root and crown system. Um, when we start getting beyond that, um, you'll start doing damage to the root and ultimately if we graze too hard to the crown. So you'll hear these ax ac axonym, axonyms in grazing call it like take half, leave half. The purpose of that is really just to make sure we're protecting the roots. You'll also hear about leaving a four inch residue height. Now, sometimes that may be half, sometimes it may not be half, but the purpose of that is to protect the crowns. So that's where some of those come from. 
We really, what we're after is leaving leaves, as guys like Dave Pratt said, because that's the photosynthetic panel that produces the energy. It's photosynthesis that's producing all this energy, and some of that energy that the plant produces, it's willing to give up in the soil to the soil microbes in exchange for nutrients and water that the plant roots alone cannot reach. And this is just a short little microscopic video of sugars, root exudates, leaving that root tip. Um, and that in turn in a soil system is gonna feed that soil uh, biology and that biology in, in turn is gonna sw swap or barter nutrients and water that that plant can't reach. So pretty amazing system. And most of this is stuff we've learned just in the last 15, 20 years. Soil microbes are super important. A lot of you have heard this before, but 90% of soil function is mediated by microbial activity, 90%. And soil function is about the abilities, the ability of the soil to capture and store water, the ability to cycle nutrients. It's really about soil health. And just looking at who's on the talk today, most of you know this stuff. Soil health is core to forage production, animal performance, and ultimately the financial viability of your farm. And it's about the resiliency or durability, if you will. Audrey and I go round and around on this word. She likes resiliency. I like durability. But anyway, I got to pick on you, Audrey. I see you there. And we've had this discussion before. Both work. But really, it's about you know, making your farm in it for the long haul. Diversity really drives this. And diversity is not, the benefits from diversity are not linear, they're exponential. And we drive this diversity by having a diversity of plants out there that build soil forage and animal health and even financial health into our systems. It's absolutely huge. We could spend an hour on that, we just don't have time right now. So the bulk of the nutrition in your forage plant is in the upper third of that plant. The lower portion of that plant is comprised primarily a non-digestible carbohydrate such as lignin. Um, and so there's really no reason that we've got to force animals to eat that. They're not doing well on that. It forces us to leave leaves. It forces us to keep that soil covered from going bare and from a, uh, in a, on a hot summer day, keeping that shaded so we're not losing all of our moisture to evaporation uh, in the process. Uh, it, it's, it's just better all the way around. I think the temptation is that when we're short on feed, when it's a drought, when we're short on cash to buy surplus feed, the temptation is to take it short. A lot of us were raised on a farm where it's like, that's waste and if we leave that out there, the farm's gonna go broke and the children are gonna starve. And you know, that may be good for a season, but we're hurting ourselves in the future. And if our goal is long-term viability on our farms, we really want to, to adhere to some of these principles. And so that's why you'll hear this term or this axiom in grazing, graze the best, trample the rest. And we'll talk more about that in a moment. So what is overgrazing? Because that question often comes up. And overgrazing is defined at a, as a function of time, not having too many livestock. It occurs when a plant has been grazed again before it regrows. We have not allowed the roots and the leaves to rebuild uh, before we hit it again. And so the plant's stressed and we're stressing it even more using up more energy reserves. And, and, and really that's, that's how we introduce a lot of weedy type species that animals aren't, that aren't palatable to the animals are interested in grazing. They're eating what they like and walking away from the rest. It, it reduces uh, the competition for nutrients, sunlight and water. And so the plants that they don't touch get the, get the big advantage there. Short grazing periods really minimize regrazing. That's really how we address this. Keep those animals moving. The number one mistake we see most grazers make or most of people attempting to run livestock on pasture is not providing adequate pasture rest. And we'll define what that looks like as we go. Um, when we have short grazing periods, as you see on the left here with a long recovery period, we have a very robust plant, a very robust root system where we have a continuous graze system or a very long grazing period and in inadequate rest, um, our forages uh, aren't gonna be our plants, our grass sward out there is not going to be as robust. And that's gonna get us in trouble when we get into drought. It's gonna get us in trouble next year, the year after, the year after. We're gonna see forage production just drop and drop and drop. And that's gonna just make uh, your operation more expensive to run. 
So how long do we rest these sites? Well, it's that old answer, it depends, that everybody hates. But it depends on weather, it depends on the intensity of the grazing event you're recovering from, it depends on the health and size of the plant root, which can, which can be influenced by the intensity of the grazing event. But maybe you picked up a new piece of ground, maybe you're renting a new pasture, maybe it's something you haven't had before. So we've, we've got to think about this. Obviously the time of year, we're not getting a lot of recovery right now. Uh, the plant composition that's out there uh, in the pasture is going to influence this. The key point here is we want to avoid determining rest periods based on the calendar. Yes, I know that's how we like to operate. You know, on Monday we do this, on Tuesday we do that or whatever. And it's nice to set up 30 paddocks, don't have to move fence, just open a gate 30 times and we come back around. But we have all this variability, particularly in a mid-continent climate like we live in here in Minnesota. This is gonna be very different in Ireland or New Zealand. And yet even there they have variability. It's just not as extreme or dramatic as we experience here. Most of our pastures are dominated by cool season forages. Now this is an accentuated graphic just to show that it's not the same throughout the year. We have times of the year that it's very strong, times of the year it's less but still growing, and other times it's somewhat in between. And for a lot of us, the last two years, these two humps have almost been flip-flopped just because we started the spring dry and started getting a lot of moisture in July. But this is typical this is a little more stereotypical of a cool season pasture. And again, you can see that it's not continuous throughout the year. Our recovery rates are different from the spring. So let's say uh, these are our growth curves here, forage growth curves here. They follow that sigmoid or S-shaped growth curve over time. And in spring, let's say we have a grazing event here and just for discussion's sake, we graze it down to here. Our recovery time from there to there in time is gonna be, that long, but if we look at something, whoops, hit the right button here in the summer, our grazing period, and I've actually measured these, in this particular example can be 50% or more longer time in order to recover than after a spring grazing event. So the point of that being, it's not always the same, and we need to take that into consideration. So when is the sward recovered? And I apologize for you small ruminant people. I don't have sheep or goats in here. I just have to have a cow picture that worked. Again, it's that answer, it depends. This is an old picture you'll still see around in grazing lit literature, and I've actually seen a few people still using it, which kind of disappoints me a little bit, and I'll explain why in a moment here. Um, but the idea was quality, finding the intersection between quality and yield was considered the best time of graze, to graze. Now quality, in this example, when this was developed, was defined as palatability and crude protein. Okay, well, we know when we get too much crude protein in the ration, we create health problems with our animals, big health problems with our animals. It just throws that energy protein balance right off. Yes, things are highly palatable here, but it's like feeding your grandchildren or your children Snickers all the time. They may love it, want to eat it, but it's not the best thing for it. So we typically don't recommend that anymore. We're looking somewhere over here, just before late stage maturity, kind of late middle to early late stage maturity. Um, that's where we get our best balance of proteins and energy and sugars and digestible carbohydrates and the, the best balance, I should say, of that. When we're too early, this is all out of whack. And we get too late, we lose palatability and it's more like straw. So this is what we generally consider the sweet spot, somewhere between middle and late maturity. Well, what does that look like out in the field? The boot stage to early seed head stage or anthesis, you can see the pollen uh, forming here on this smooth brown grass. I used an oat plant here just because it's easier to visualize on an oat plant. This is actually just a tad past boot stage. But between boot stage and anthesis, we have about the best balance of protein and energy. We're getting the most tonnage out there. The grass is almost mature, mature but it's still palatable here. Um, and we can take a portion of this grass, 30 to 50% of it, still have a lot left. The animals aren't super interested in that because a lot of that's lignifying already. We're still leaving leaves out there. We're still providing shade to the ground for reducing evaporation. Um, we're getting all the best of both worlds, uh, all the best of all these worlds in this process. Later in the year, after, after pretty much summer solstice, when we start regularly hitting mid-June to summer solstice, when we start regularly hitting 
temperatures in the 80 degree range, most of these cool season plants, they are racing, racing in the spring. I'll back up here, racing in the spring to reproduce. They want to get this done before temperatures get hot and dry because they go dormant, they go to sleep. And all these plants want to reproduce to perpetuate their genetics for the future. Well, when we get beyond that, they're not so interested in that. And they'll stay in more of a vegetative stage. And we typically feel that at the one, two, three, this is starting the fourth leaf here, at the three leaf stage is what we consider fully recovered for mid to late summer afterwards. And that's gonna look something like this, a late summer recovered pasture. And we can let this stuff go. I've let stuff go for over a hundred days after we've gotten past that mid to late June time, uh, grazed it, right at about anthesis or a little before, and hit it high, hard with heavy stock density. And then, then we've let it sit and used it as stockpiled forage in October. And this is what it'll look like. We will start having leaves die and the, from the bottom uh, as this continues to grow and as new leaves, but that's okay. That's gonna provide armor and, and protection for that soil and we can live with that. So uh, it's, it's not quite as critical <coughs> later in the year. So this is why we encourage adaptive or flex grazing. Adaptive high stock density grazing, lots of different names for it. Uh, the beauty of this is it allows you as the practitioner to address multiple objectives uh, and goals on the same piece of ground. It's not a routine or rigid system. It's not based around the calendar. We don't have to get around every 28 or 30 or 32 days. We don't want to for all the reasons we've discussed. It's adapted, to, you can adapt it to changing conditions. It gets dry, it gets cold, you get an early frost, you get a late frost, you flood out somewhere. You can adapt to this stuff. And it's based on constant observation. You need to be a student, not only of your animals, but even of your pastures. We can look at soils, weather, forage, forage and recovery system, how well our livestock is doing. How about the wild things out there? Microbes, worms, birds, snakes, reptiles, all those things. We could spend a whole hour just talking about observation tools and what to use. And it allows us to deal with variability. And we all know we get plenty of that. Um, it deals with uh, differences in topography, soils. We all have differences in that across our farms. Differences in forage, vegetation, even our crop rotation, if we're doing cash grain crops as, as part of our uh, farm operation. And it can vary throughout the year based on labor, even quality of life. Like Audrey said earlier, you know, we got the best of both worlds now. The animals aren't here and they're coming back after they calf. Uh, it sounds like that's going to be a huge boon to your quality of life there. How about emergency or health issues? How about the crisis in the world that we're dealing with today? You know, the current world events. You know, we, we need to be variable to adjust for these things that we can't foresee or predict uh, in our planning. And so variabilities and, and the ability to be adaptable, I think is huge. If, if we could sum up grazing management in one sentence, and I got this from a rancher in North Dakota and I never got their name, but I love this quote. Grazing management is about getting the animals to the right paddock at the right time for the right reason. Getting the animals to the right paddock at the right time for the right reason. And that really sums up a lot of what we're talking about. Sometimes we may want to trample uh, forage in order to feed the livestock in the soil, the soil microbes. We need tall forage to do that. We're going to let this get a little more mature. Yes, some of the plants are not going to be palatable. If we have a monoculture or only two or three plants uh, in, in our mix out there, if we're using a whole old hay field that's just uh, orchard grass and alfalfa, that's a lot trickier than when we have a lot of diversity. When we have a lot of diversity in these high trample scenarios, we're only grazing about a third of the above ground biomass that's out there. We want to trample the rest. And we're doing this on a specific site for a specific reason. We're not necessarily doing this on every acre, every paddock across the field. These are sites we're going to determine this time of year is a great time to do it. We're going to say, you know what, there's that knob over there or whatever. We want to do something a little different over there. Trampling could go a long way um, to dealing with this. And we can trample both cover crops and perennial forage. It may not be a complete, complete trample, but when we trample, instead of when those plants are decomposing and oxidizing into the atmosphere, where most of the carbon in there is going into the atmosphere, 
we're now getting some of it down on the ground in contact where the microbes can utilize some of that and help build soil organic matter and feed that soil biology. So that again, the higher the density, the greater the positive impact. Density meaning number of animal pounds per acre. We're gonna get much better manure distribution. We're gonna get more even forage utilization. It's gonna help us increase soil organic matter, increase water holding capacity, soil microbe populations, plant diversity, forage quality, particularly bricks. We'll talk about more in the minute. In that in a minute, it's gonna increase forage production, increase bird performance. Can anybody think a reason not to do this? Because it's probably all of these things are gonna help decrease our overall farm input costs out there. We're not having to buy fertilizer. We're not sweating the drought as much. Our forage production is going to go up. We're going to get more bang out of the land we're paying taxes and even a mortgage on sometimes. So what are some indicators we can look at? Again, you need to be a student of your pasture. This requires, as Dave Pratt says, boots on the ground and eyes looking down. Um, is there bare ground? What's our plant diversity out there? What does that paddock that was grazed two months, two weeks ago look like? How about the one that was grazed a month ago? What does it look like? What life is out there? Are there reptiles and amphibians? These are predators of insects. Predators of insects are predators of microbes at or near the soil surface. You know, birds, these birds are predators too. And we gotta have, if we have a high predator base, it means we have an absolutely huge prey base. They're just excellent indicators. Bricks, we talked about bricks. You can measure this with a refractometer for those who don't know, and I think most of you do. Bricks is a measure of plant solids, predominantly sugars. Um, it's really nutrition of the plant. It's highest in the afternoon on sunny days. And it's a result of increased soil organic matter and soil microbe populations. We've documented this over and over and over again. As the bricks goes up, uh, the scale on the bottom here, as bricks goes up, animal performance goes up. A uh, pretty nice little relationship there that we see over and over again. And we start getting bricks uh, in our plants at the, the 11 to 15% range. Or at, this is on cattle, but and this is because this is what we have data on, but we're gonna see similar things in other ruminants. You know, we're starting to rival gains that they see in a feedlot uh, out there. So animal performance can be huge and we can take advantage of this in our management. So in grazing, we control the timing, the frequency, the duration and the intensity of our grazing, regardless of the weather, regardless of market prices, regardless of government policy and regulations. These are still things we control in our operation and they can have a huge influence. And this is really what makes it happen. Modern fence technology, and we're gonna spend a little time talking about fence. Most people with small ruminants, e-fences, they're, they're probably the choice. Wonderful technology. It's been around for around 20, 25 years now. Um, there's lots of options out there on, on your, what you get out there. Some people have made multi-strand single wire work, two or three wires to work. I don't know that we have time to get into that today. I just wanna cover some key things about fencing. Um, but first, what do the numbers mean? You order this stuff based on the numbers. And so your first number here, nine, that's the number of horizontal wires. 35, that number is the height of the fence, fencing that you're looking at. And then this last number, this one happens to be 12, that's the distance between vertical supports or wires uh, on that mesh type fencing. So that's just a brief explanation of that. Just a few tips on portable fence netting. Um, make sure you use a large enough en energizer. Uh, it should be treated as its own fence. Now you can have multiple ones of these hooked together, but I see people who struggle with trying to hook it into their bigger perimeter fence. And sometimes they don't have a big enough energizer to handle that. And it sucks down the voltage on that. And if they're grazing multiple species, this could be a problem. You need adequate voltage on that fence. So you're gonna need a digital voltmeter. Uh, we recommend a minimum of 4,000 volts for small ruminants, five or would be better. One ground rod may not be enough. Because you're moving this all the time, ground rods are tough to put in and out, especially if they get wedged between the rocks. And the temptation is to just put one, but it may not be enough. So really watch that. You need to clear or trample a path uh, for the fence before you put it out there. Lots of ways to do that. And then I encourage you not to leave it in place for more than about a week because the grass and the weeds and the forbs and everything tend to grow up in there and then it's gonna start shorting the fence out. So this is something that's gonna be on the move. 
and these don't handle snow and ice super well. I know some people that can keep them out in the snow uh, and do okay with it, but understand if we get an ice storm, and we had one last week here, um, quarter inch ice and everything, uh, it could drag this thing right to the ground. So, and it's going to shorten the life of it too. These, these were not designed to be uh, a winter fence scenario, but just keep that in mind. And we do have to think about culling problem animals. If you got fence jumpers, they're going to train their buddies and you're going to have nothing, nothing but trouble. So if they're a problem, um, we need to find a market for them real quick. Adaptive grazing. One of the biggest things you can do in adaptive grazing is change your grazing pattern. So if you're grazing long linear strips one day, think about dividing it up into more uh, square instead of rectangular, more square the next time or going at a diagonal through that paddock the next time, or changing that diagonal uh, the next time you go through. Mix this stuff up. This is super easy to do with portable fencing. Um, yeah, just keep mixing stuff up, it's huge. Uh, usually with square paddocks, we get better forage utilization, and with long rectangular paddocks, we increase our trampling. So just to keep that in mind. We can also facilitate what's called herd effect, and herd effect is short-term high density of congregation of animals on a planned location to facilitate your vegetation management. This works better with larger herds or flocks than others, okay? It's gonna work much better with 500 sheep than it's going to with five. Doesn't mean you can't do it, it's just harder to do. Lots of ways to do this. Drag the mineral feeder in a thistle patch when it's blooming. Put a small square bale of hay in a willow patch to encourage them, something different oftentimes if they've been grazing on, on nice lush vegetation for the last four weeks, something different, like a little bale of dry hay can attract everybody over there. Unrolling bales on a gravelly knoll could be an, uh, another option or creating a paddock within a paddock, which we'll talk about here next. So paddock within a paddock is the, if this, whoops, if this is an example of what you need, again, you can subdivide that down. You can also create a small skinny strip here while you're over setting up your, your next paddock for the rest of the day. So you can bring them into something like this, leave them in there for 30 minutes, maybe an hour. They're gonna go up and down, up and down, up and down, trample a lot of that, then reel up this wire and let them have it the rest of the day. It's going to change how they graze this versus this, and that's definitely gonna be different than something like this. We can even do a small corner like this. Let's say you got a brushy patch here, a thistle patch here. Run something across here, stick everybody in there while you come over here and put up your next paddock wire and leave them in. You're out there anyway and leave them in there for another 30 minutes or whatever. And you can go out now this time of year, unless Mike, you get you know a foot and a half of snow today, um, but you can go out this time of year and identify sites where you might wanna try doing this. Again, it's not, it's an adaptive system. We change this. It's not the same every day, every time on every paddock. So I want to run through estimating paddock needs because this is what we base this on in the next few minutes here. Um, I'm just going to use a real small example here. 15 ewes, I grabbed 250 pounds, 23 lambs at 50 pounds. So we got about 5,000 animal pounds here. I'm just, I like round numbers. They're lactating ewes, so we're going to use three and growing lambs. So we're going to use three and a half percent of body weight for what our dry matter intake needs are for the day. So that gives us 157 pounds per day of dry matter. Let's just say our forage height is 16 inches. And, and what I've found with grasses like smooth brome and quack and some of those cool season grasses, 16 inches is often where we hit that three leaf stage. What's also cool is 16 inches is the height of your standard farm chore boot. So you got a little tape measure with you out there already. If we figure our dry matter per acre inch at 150 pounds and based on NRCS clip data from around the state, this is fairly average. It can be lower, it can be higher, but this is pretty average, not uncommon. Um, so we got 16 inches at 150 pounds. That gives us 2,400 pounds per acre of available forage. Well, we're not gonna graze all of that, right? We're only gonna take, in this particular example, we're only gonna take 50% of the above ground biomass. So that means we got 1,200 pounds per acre of available forage. We need 75, 175 pounds a day. We have 1,200 pounds available, that means we need uh, 15 hundredths of an acre per day. 15 hundredths of an acre, or if you don't know, an acre is 43,560 square feet. I'd encourage you to memorize that number right along with your cell phone number if you're a grazer. 
times uh, 1,500 gives us about 6,500 square feet that these animals need to meet their dry matter intake, intake for the day and our goals for forage production on that for a day. Uh, we take that by the square root. It gives us a paddock size of 81 feet by 81 feet or 65 feet by 100, okay? Again, this is not an exact science, okay? This is just to get us in the ballpark. So let's, I don't get hung up on decimals and things like that. So we can use paddock subdivision. I keep getting that, whoops, sorry. We're getting the wrong button here. So we need this many square feet, right? Which is 15 hundredths of an acre. We got 5,000 sheep on 15 hundredths of an acre. Gives us 33,000 pounds per acre. That's gonna be our stock density for they're out there, time they're out there. But if we cut that paddock in half and give them half in the morning, half in the afternoon, or half at noon and half at five o'clock in the evening, that gets us up to 67,000 pounds per acre. And if we do it three times a day, it gets us up to 100,000 animal pounds per acre. This is getting into high, ultra, well, not quite ultra high stock density. This is getting into much higher stock density. We're gonna see a very different forage response from this one to this one. Does it mean you need to do this every day? No, do we wanna do this every day? No, we wanna change it up. But if you can identify a few days out of the year on, some few, on a few sites that you want to accelerate management on, think about doing this. We set aside time to make hay. We set aside time to put up manure. We set aside time to spend the day fixing fence. We spend the day drenching, drenching lambs and ear tagging lambs. We set aside time to do all sorts of things. How about setting aside a couple days out of the year to go out and do multiple paddock shifts? What a more pleasant way to spend your day than with your livestock if you're a grazer. Isn't that why we do this stuff? Anyway, something to think about. And again, it's not every day all the time. Pick those sites. In order to get the maximum bang for your buck here, we need tall forage out there so there's a lot to trample, okay? Adaptive management, we want to alternate again stock densities. We don't want to move through the rotation in the same pattern. We, alter, we want to alter height when our plants are grazed. We want to alternate the length of the rest period. Sometimes we may rest it for 30 days. Other times we may rest it for 100 days. Some sites we may only graze once a year. Alternate the time of year when we're grazing that paddock. And the easiest way to do this is beginning in a different paddock every year. Keep records. Have a plan. Now, when I say have a plan, that doesn't mean, okay, on day one, they're here. Day two, they're there. Think about, think about all these things above. Think about what we talked about earlier in the last few slides about identifying those areas you want to do higher stock density or even facilitate herd effect. That's what I mean by having a plan. Not necessarily, oh, we're going to be through in 30 days every time. You're going to get frustrated. But target areas have specific goals for other areas. And then when you get there, based on all the other stuff we talk about, that's when you implement either higher stock density, herd effect, longer rest, hey, what the heck, skip a paddock once in a while and give it a longer rest. So all those things can be part of it. You're not going to get it all done in one year, but just keep changing things up. I want to give you a few quick examples to close here on how we can use it. Self-facing slopes. Oftentimes, they're a drier climate there. Grass is less dense. Um, let it get tall. Think about grazing it middle June to early July and get a trample if possible. You may only get to graze this site once during the whole year, but doing something like this, you're probably going to increase forage production in maybe one, two, three, four years, depending on the weather. You might be able to start grazing it twice a year. You've doubled, you can double your forage production. It may not ever be the best producing piece of ground on your farm, but we can sure make it better. How about light soils with a weak sward? Again, same thing. Graze a tall hawk, high stock density. Think about a longer rest period on those sites. And again, brushy patches, thistly patches in the corner of a paddock, we can facilitate herd, event, herd effect for high density grazing. Outwintering, um, in a, just a real quick, Peter wanted me to touch on. Sheep, I think it's very doable. They come with a thick woolly coat, good grief, doesn't get any better than that. Um, they, they handle outwintering very, very well, maybe even better than cattle. Very low requir water requirement, we'll use snow if it's available. Having a windbreak with a bedding pack for the really nasty days can be great. On the nicer days, they're going to lay out on the remains of the bales. Um, and we can even graze complex covers with sheep well into the winter. Uh, uh, very, very doable. 
Goats, different story. Again, need a roof. If you've been around goats, they need a roof over their head when they're wet. It, they just can't handle that. Now, this can be portable, okay? We can move it from year to year. They do need feed need the shelter, near the shelter in wet weather, and they need clean bedding to lie down on. You got to stay on top of that. It's just like with dairy calves. You got to stay on top of that clean bedding or they're going to they're gonna get sick. But goats will venture out on the nicer days. They'll go out and browse. They'll even go out and girdle things like buckthorn and Siberian elm on nicer days. So if that's something you want to work on, there's an opportunity there. But let's be systematic in how we do it. All these little green patches that you see here, this is four different years, four different paddocks over four different years. You can see where bales were placed and where they were grazed. Very systematic here, grid-like pattern. And you can see the positive impacts of that for four years versus kind of willy-nilly. Um, you know, we're not going to spend money on fertilizer and go out there and just go willy nilly with the spreader out there. We're going to do it somewhat intentional like this. And we can do the same with bale grazing. Yes, they are bale grazing, but how we do it is going to have a big influence on the positive and or negative response that we get. So with that, I thank you. And Peter, if we have time for questions or if Lance, you got a couple things that you think we should hit that I didn't have time to squeeze in here. Please jump on. Oh, nothing additional from me, Kim. Good presentation. Thank you. He was easy on you there. He was. He's just being nice. <laughs> you want to take your screen back, Peter? Or do I have to unshare? Oh, here we go. Stop share. I'm just, go. yeah. There you go. There we go. Okay. Sure. Uh, I don't have a question that I have a comment Kent, about how succinctly you have included really a lot of the key points of good grazing management. I think this presentation should be like required viewing for anybody who wants to get into livestock or people who have been doing livestock production and not grazing. Um, they're just such fundamental um, principles that are often ignored. And I think you did a really good job of, of holding them up. Thank you, appreciate that. Kent, uh, as we come into spring here, what would be the recovery height you would like to see before putting uh, cow-calf pairs out there? Yeah, great question, Richard. And uh, now's the perfect time of year to be thinking about that. Um, I, I like to get my forage at least 10 inches tall, at mm. least to the two, if not three leaf stage. And, and there's a couple reasons for that. One is um, uh, to make sure there's enough leaf out there for recovery. Once those plants get up there, they've burned through their root reserves and crown reserves, and they need photosynthesis in order to recover. And if we're clipping that too short, we're hurting that photosynthetic panel. The second reason is related to herd health. And as we all know, we've all had animals who just can't wait to get out on that lush green pasture and they eat it, eat it, eat it, eat it, and it's just squirting out their back end. Mm -hmm. And that means the protein uh, uh, energy balance is completely whacked out. They're getting way too much protein. That's putting stress on their metabolic system. A couple things are happening. Number one, they're going to go backwards and wait. Um, number two, they're setting themselves up for problems. Uh, four to six weeks later. And the biggest one for most people on pasture is pink eye problems. So if you get in a jam and, and you've got, uh, and you need to get them out, think about just part-time grazing and the rest of the time having them on dry hay. That's one way to deal with it. And I know hay's tight this year. It has been from last year and people are struggling. That's probably going to be realistic. Send them out with a full belly of hay let them pick up a little protein out there, especially if your hay quality is low, but don't keep them out there all the time. The other is if you can at all wait, try it all possible to wait. It's so tempting to want to put them out there. We're tired of feeding hay. They're tired of hay. They want to get out there. Even waiting another week to 10 days sometimes can make a huge difference, not only in your pasture productivity uh, come July and August, but it's also going to have an impact on herd health. And, and there's some evidence showing that that pink eye thing um, there's some strong strong evidence to support that now. So you can avoid a lot of problems, particularly if you're in an organic system or want to do a more natural way where you don't want to use vaccines or antibiotics. Um, that can go a long way to help with pink eye. 
And how about paddocks that um, had a lot of uh, growth going into fall, so there's a lot of dead material, dry thank, material thank, out there now. Thank you. Is the more, well, yeah, I just remember that myself. So that's another way to do it, is use your stockpile from last year that has a lot of dry material going into it. Those should be the paddocks we want to start in anyway. And, and again, switch those around from year to year. Don't always have it the same one, but great point, Richard. Um, yes, that is another method. And so for waiting, um, Jill, that I think appropriate uh, height of the sward to be able to put the returning cow herd out there, um, what would you recommend about the, how fast you want to be moving them to get, to get uh, <laughs> everything uh, quickly grazed to, to be able to um, be managing all of the grass. Yeah, and, you know and I mean? move, move, yep, yep. You're, you're worried about things going to seed head. And again, yeah. if your paddocks are high diversity, if you've got a lot of plants in there, um, that's much less of an issue than if the only thing you have out there is orchard grass or the only thing you have out there is smooth brome, where everything's going to mature at the same time. Um, keeping going fast, um, just topping it. 30% or less of the above ground biomass is what you should think about taking the first time through, keep them moving, get across it really fast. The next time through, you're going to slow down. Are you going to keep in front of everything? No. <clears throat> Excuse me, for some people, you know, if you've got a lot of ground to cover, you may want to think about taking some of that for hay, but make sure you're going to have adequate rest after you take that hay before you bring those animals back. If possible, we want to move paddocks around that we do take hay from uh, uh, around so we're not doing it on the same paddock every year all the time. And thirdly, if at all possible, if we can feed that hay back out on the paddock it was harvested on, either in a bale grazing situation or out, rollery, out, roll, out, roll, out rolling it out, excuse me, uh, or um, even as a, even if it's a site that's got a a, a knob, a thin knob of grass out there that you just want to increase that sward, save that as an opportunity paddock for later and, and bale graze or unroll out there systematically to build some fertility. Um, but keep moving, keep them moving fast. Um, try not to take it short, leave plenty of res residual height out there. Again, they're burning through those root reserves. They need that leaf for photosynthesis in order to recover. Some of them you may come through the second time, it's pretty diverse, but those should be sites that you've pre-identified that you're gonna go, you know, that's okay. I want more trample out there. Yes, get less utilization. I'm okay with taking a little less. There's enough diversity out there, they're gonna be fine. Or I'm gonna do it for one day, I'm gonna stretch them a little bit, and then the next day they're gonna be on good stuff. And really, we're finding that you can go about two weeks on pretty mature forage, where the dominant forage is pretty mature, and not have a long lasting impact on those animals. Would I wanna do that on animals I'm finishing for harvest for a grass fed market in July? Absolutely not. Could I do it with cow calf or dry animals for a week or two, as long as there's some diversity out there and they're not going backwards? Yes, I could do that, but that's about as far as I'd wanna stretch it. So again, mix that stuff around, move them fast. Some of it's gonna get a little ahead of you. And that orchard grass looks awful scary out there on June 15th when it's all headed out. But if you look down and there's alfalfa and clover and Timothy and Kentucky bluegrass and other stuff that's not headed out, so what? You know, just high stock density, trample it, then you're setting yourself up for a stockpile forage situation later in the year. Kent, this is Carmen. Hey, Carmen. Good morning or good afternoon. I mean, um, there's some new regulations uh, starting to come out on grazing uh, CRP, especially some of the older CRP. Any recommendations on what to look for or how to consider using that in uh, in a system? So is that a like a is that the one the CRP extension where uh, what are they calling? There's a name for it. I just looked at it the other day. This Can't remember. That's one possible one. Now you can't use ship on former CRP, but there's like a new CRP sign up that allows you to graze it. Um, and you're gonna get a payment for it based on a percentage of average pasture rental rates in your area. Um, but you have to graze it after the primary nesting window. 
I would look real closely at what are they defining as the primary nesting window. And I would also look at predominantly what's out there for forage. If it's all brome out there and they say you can't touch it till August 1st, I'd run as fast and far away from that as possible. I don't think the money you would get in the program would offset the cost uh, uh, of, of loss in forage production and animal performance out there. A lot of times those, those funds look attractive up front, but really think it through carefully. Now, if it's a site that's predominantly warm season natives and they say you can graze it after July 15th, that's probably doable. The problem's going to be is long-term management of that site. You're gonna to wanna to get in there and graze to maintain uh, those warm season natives sometime in May and maybe even early June, depending on the season. And if you're not allowed to do that, long-term, I think there's potential to hurt their, your sward. Again, those programs, I think, paint us in a corner where we can't be adaptive. We have to manage according to that. And I personally, my philosophy is I'd rather be adaptive and, and change around where I'm going to graze. If I'm concerned about meadowlarks and bobolinks and dick thistles, um, I'm going to leave areas that I'm probably not going to graze if the diversity is there until after July 1st at a bare minimum, maybe even July 15th. I doubt that I'm going to do it till August, you know, just because of forage quality and what I might lose. But, you know, that's okay, too. Sometimes it's okay just to maybe graze a paddock once in the year and late in the year. Again, mix it up, change it up. But under this program, I believe you have to delineate what acres you're going to do, and you're boxed into that late summer, fall grazing season. Well, now you're grazing it basically the same time every year, and I think that's going to work against you in the long time. And really, from an ecological services standpoint, as far as soil health, water quality, and even ultimately wildlife uh, populations, um, I think those things are well-intentioned, but they don't. Don't don't fit the bill. So um, that's my answer to that, Carmen. Um, yeah, some people may just disagree. One other, just one other yeah. sidebar on that. Over the years, I've seen where you do a, a spring burn on, especially the warm season grasses that I've got, and you do it before nesting, and then you seem to have a really nice lush growth later in the summer, which would be probably post Fourth of July. That might add some uh, diverse opportunities. Perhaps. Yeah, now we're interjecting the other management tool of fire, and we didn't even get into that. That's a whole nother ball game. But I think Lance has got some comments on those programs. He probably knows them way better than I do. Okay, uh, I'll, I'll just without getting into a whole bunch of details on it, uh, just say one thing: if it's existing CRP, um, you'll be allowed to graze it with a whole lot of stipulations, but there will be a payback of a portion of your payment. You won't get paid, you have to pay back. Okay, okay. Other than that, I would agree with a lot of what, the majority of what Kent said, it, it's not very good forage quality out there. I would add, Carmen, that if the CRP period has expired and you still got those uh, perennial natives out there to be able to knock it down or graze anything else that's um, non-native competing with it very early uh, would therefore cycle the carbon down rather than up into the atmosphere, if there's any opportunity for that. Yes. I guess just one Quick clarification, Kent. Um, when you were when you were talking about fencing there, are you primarily recommending electrified netting then as your cross fence? Am I did I catch that correctly? You know, for most people, that's probably the simplest and easiest thing to jump into. I know some shepherds who are doing a very, very good job with two or three strands of polywire with small ruminants. Um, you do need to train these animals from an early age, their, their mothers need to be trained and respect that fence in order to do it. It can be highly effective. Um, you, you're, you need to build that relationship, that trust relationship between you and your animals with they, that they know they're not gonna go hungry, they know they're not gonna go thirsty, um, that they're not gonna need to stick their head through that fence to get something to eat, that you're providing them everything they need. Um, 
you, 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 it's a higher degree of management um, for somebody who's getting started in this, that may not be the way to go. But for somebody, somebody willing to put the time into it and do that and make it happen and to be willing to call those problem animals, even if she's your best you, you know, uh, she's not your best you anymore if she's teaching everybody else to go over the fence. Um, yeah, then there's possibilities there, but I think it's the easiest, cheapest thing for p people to get into. Um, we didn't even talk, I didn't even get into perimeter fencing because that's another hour conversation. So, but for interior fencing, yes, I think for, for people just getting started, that's, that's your low hanging fruit. Um, curious, Kent, if you've run across anybody that's making a business of uh, grazing um, in these solar panel uh, pens or the areas that are fenced in already. Yes. Um, to manage under there. Yes. If you are interested in small ruminants and you live in an area where there are solar farms, that is a huge opportunity knocking right now. Uh, there are a number of people in Minnesota doing that. There are several operations that are expanding. We're talking major acreage here. Yeah. Um, it's my understanding there are tens of thousands of more acres of solar farms um, planned on coming to Minnesota, maybe upwards of another 50,000. One of the pushbacks uh, coming from local units of government is that this is ag land being taken out of agricultural production and they don't want that to be part of their community. But hey, guess what? Grazing sheep under these things makes it ag land again. It's just not corn and beans. So um, yes, there are people doing that. Um, we actually are part of a uh, Minnesota Department of Ag sustainable um, ag grant to look at changes in um, plant species composition uh, in these solar farms, specifically with sheep grazing starting this summer. I still don't know how we're going to pull that one off given the COVID restrictions, but we'll see what we can do. Um, anyway, that's going to be a three-year project and Minnesota Native Landscapes is the uh, uh, farmer that's part of that. And we're going to look at sites that they're already grazing, but they're not alone. I know several other people doing this and I think it's a huge opportunity for a beginning farmer, hey, you don't even need to own land. You yeah. need a trailer and some e-net and a way of, and and good good relation relationship skills and working with others, and you could be rocking and rolling on this stuff pretty fast. <laughs>